So hi everyone, uh, good night. Tonight we have another uh, sort of special TVMR. This time we'll be focusing on clinical reasoning with incredible Dr. Daniel Ruiz Triple. Just uh, a little bit of introduction. Dr. Ruiz Triple is a board certified general internist and hospitalist in the Department of Medicine at MGH and is a member of the core educator faculty and associate program director for the focus for the internal medicine residency program. He additionally carries for patients as part of the Massachusetts General Hospital Home Hospital, where he serves as associate medical director for education and training. He graduated with a degree in biology from the University of Florida and attended a medical school at the University of South Florida College of Medicine. He completed his internal medicine residency and later chief residency at MGH. And here, his main interests lie in medical education, specifically diagnostic reasoning, clinical and bedside teaching, as well as physical diagnosis and focus. So thank you so much for coming, Dr. Restrepo. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Rafa. It's, I'm super excited to be here and a little bit nervous, but, but really happy to be <laughs> hanging out with everyone again. Um, so before we move on, uh, we'd love to ask you what drove you into internal medicine and what made you stay, um, not that person fellowship later? Um, so I think to me, it was part of it was, was that it was very much like the, the detective solving, um, the, the kind of just the, the process of diagnosis being so integral to internal medicine. Um, and it was, it was mentors. It was seeing the people that, that were the doctors that I wanted to be that, that were brilliant diagnosticians, um, but also were there to, to, to serve the suffering and to help people in their time of need. And that's, that's kind of what like drove me to internal medicine. And, and then when I was in residency, I, I, I flirted with different subspecialties, but I ultimately could, you know, never really marry one. I, I, I would miss AKI if I went into ID and I would miss, you know, heart failure if I went into hepatology. And so like, it just, that eventually like, that's just called internal medicine. So I just, I had to stick with it. Got it. Sounds wonderful. Uh, so maybe you could talk a little bit about your do for fun outside of medicine. Outside of medicine, um, I've been, um, I've, I've trying to get a little bit into, into wine and learning more about wine and traveling and, and sort of learning about how wine is made and how it's different from different places. Um, and I also really enjoy um, playing music and, and also scuba diving. I haven't been able to scuba dive as much as I'd like to recently, but that's, those are like the things that I really, that bring me a lot of joy. And what is the best wine you ever tasted? Uh, yeah, I think that that's like a super personal question. I mean, I'm very, very, very partial to Southern Rhone wines from France, um, specifically Chateau neuf de Pop, but like, that's a very, like, you know, like there's no objectively one wine being better than the other. It's just kind of like what you really love. Thank you. Uh, we also have Madalena who will be presenting the case. Could you present yourself, friends? Yeah. Hey, everyone. It's um, really, really nice to be here and seeing, seeing everyone. And um, yeah, my name is Madalena. You can call me Maddie. I'm on a research year between my third and fourth year of medical school. Uh, and I'm really excited to present a case today. Um, and what do you do for fun outside of medicine? This what do I do for fun? Yeah. So I think one of my favorite hobbies that I've gotten to do a lot more of this research year is hiking. And uh, so I just, I love kind of exploring hikes. I write, I'm in San Francisco right now. So I, um, there's a lot of really amazing hikes, like a half hour, an hour from the city. Uh, and I love yeah, eating all different types of foods. So going out to dinner and hiking are probably my two um, biggest hobbies. Yeah, and Mario is also an awesome wild foreigner, as Andrew pointed out. <laughs> uh, we also have Shema helping with the uh, scribing. Uh, could you present, present yourself, Shema? Hello, everyone. I'm Shema. I'm currently a fifth medical student in Berlin, and um, I could be more delighted um, seeing Dr. Restrepo here. Um, it's always so nice having him here. And when I saw his name on the spreadsheet, I immediately signed up for, uh, for, for scribing. Uh, even though it is now 1 a.m. in Berlin. <laughs> yeah. And uh, besides medicine, I enjoy photography, going to museums. and But now, because I'm studying for my exams, um, it's not a monotonous life at the moment. But after then, it's more exciting, ho hopefully. Yeah, I feel you. I was talking with the, uh, the team in the background. I'm studying for step three right now. So... 
basically working and studying. Um, so yeah, let's hope for a better future. <laughs> uh, so uh, maybe we can start with the case. Um, can you share the screen, Shema, please? All right, when, so- Whenever yeah. you're ready, Maddie. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so the chief concern is diarrhea. Uh, and to give you a little bit about the HPI, so this is a 43-year-old transgender female uh, who is presenting to the emergency department with acute on chronic non-bloody diarrhea. So to give some a little bit more information about the time course, so uh, the patient says that the diarrhea has been ongoing for about two months. Uh, and she reports that she has been having about five loose stools a day for nearly two months. But over the past week, the diarrhea has now acutely worsened to nearly 10 bowel movements per day. So nearly uh, every hour. So because it's acutely worsened, that's why she presented to the emergency department. Um, so as I said, she describes these as um, soft liquid non-bloody. Uh, she can't identify any clear triggers. She says that this is occurring both at night and during the day, uh, but cannot recall eating any uncooked foods, you know, prior to the diarrhea or potentially spoiled foods before this kind of acute exacerbation. Um, she does notice that sometimes um, it looks a little bit worse after eating, but no specifically clear triggers. Uh, and I'll pause there to get your thoughts. Okay. Thanks for that. So we have a 43-year-old um, transgender woman, we'll refer to her as a woman um, from now on, but just worth like noting that um, folks' anatomy as far as transitions go and, and sort of what procedures they've undergone in their transition are super important in general to think about their health, to think about screening, to think about different pathology that may or may not be present based on their underlying anatomy and undermining underlying hormonal state. So like what did they receive to undergo their transition? All these things are, I think, important to iron out. Uh, in addition to the usual kind of approach that one takes with um, diarrhea, and so in my mind, I as I'm approaching diarrhea, I, I time tempo is king. So because the vast majority, by kind of base rate and epi, the vast majority of acute diarrhea defined as less than four weeks, which I always thought was really cruel to make somebody wait four weeks to call that acute. Um, uh, is, is infectious in origin. And anything that extends beyond that can start and sort of start to broaden out the differential diagnosis. The other, the other things that are super key before you even delve into the HPI a lot more is to kind of ask yourself, what is the immune competent state of this person? Because the minute you, you enter a state of immunocompromise, you are opening Pandora's box in terms of the, the differential diagnosis. So those are a couple of things that I like would like to kick around in my head before we go, before I go too much into this. But the other symptoms that I obviously find very helpful in evaluating diarrhea are night symptoms. And so is she waking up at night to have bowel movements? And it sounds like she is having some sort of nocturnal awakening. And that's really important because um, as we'll talk about the buckets of diarrhea later on, really that takes that makes osmotic diarrhea a lot less likely. So the, the idea here is that if, if you have a truly osmotic diarrhea, meaning that you're putting something into your, into your intestinal tract that's drawing water and causing diarrhea, presumably if you're asleep, you're not gonna be doing that and you're gonna probably lessen the frequency of diarrhea. So, the fact that she's having night episodes makes it more likely to be an infectious diarrhea, a secretory diarrhea, an inflammatory diarrhea. Although with regards to that last, um, that last bucket, we, we, we haven't found out about other constitutional symptoms, but, um, and we haven't found out about pain or blood or mucus, which you'd also expect with, with inflammatory diarrhea. So that may be worth kind of exploring uh, in, in targeted history questions. Um, a little bit later. So again, so it seems like it's a chronic diarrhea at this point that has probably accelerated recently for unclear reasons. We don't have, we do have nighttime symptoms. Um, we don't appear, at least from what we know thus far, that there are overt inflammatory symptoms that are present. And then there's a lot more questions that you're going to want to ask. Um, and the other thing is not to get sort of fooled by um, one thing that I've been uh, fooled by before is actually melanin. So just really like actually clarify if they're having a GI bleed or if they're having diarrhea, that's, that's something that I've missed in the past. And so 
the questions that I'm kind of asking myself are going to be things that we're going to hear about, like what are her medications? What are is her, what is her immune competence state? What is actually her sexual history, um, which can become relevant in certain kinds of diarrhea in terms of folks that practice anal receptive intercourse and and um, and that kind of unique epidemiology. Uh, the other questions that I'm going to have are what is her travel history? Has she had any antimicrobial exposures recently? Um, and and again, more targeted sort of HPI questions based on that, but maybe I'll pause there. All right. Um, fantastic discussion after the first eloquence. So uh, I will jump into a little bit more details about the past medical history and some other kind of review systems. Um, so in terms of review systems, um, the patient reports that they've felt um, that they've had chills um, they're also reporting some diffuse abdominal pain uh, and rectal pain. Uh, they deny any fevers, weight loss, and no melanin, so no um, one in the stool that they've noticed. Uh, in terms of past medical history, so the patient has um, a history of HIV AIDS. Uh, so in October of this year, just a few months, four, few months ago, the last CD4 was 24 and the viral load was 98,000. The patient um, you know, has been prescribed some TUSA, but has not been adherent to the medications for the past year. Um, the patient also has a history of opportunistic infections related to um, AIDS. So they've had cryptococcal meningitis and also an episode of uh, pulmonary Kaposi sarcoma um, for which she's undergone chemotherapy. Uh, this patient also has methamphetamine use disorder that's been complicated by um, several episodes of psychosis. Um, and they also have a history of hep C, um, status post treatment with Epclusa, um, but the viral load for the hep C was undetectable earlier this year. Um, in terms of medication, so the patient is prescribed Sintuza for her HIV, but has not been adherent to that medication. Um, and also uh, is prescribed Seroquel and Zyprexa. Uh, in terms of family history, there's no pertinent family history. Um, for social history, so in terms of housing, um, the patient is currently um, unhoused in San Francisco. So the patient spends some nights um, a street homeless and then other nights in um, like an SRO, a single room occupancy unit. Uh, in terms of health-related behaviors, I mentioned um, methamphetamine use. Um, that's uh, more remote use. Uh, the patient does not report using methamphetamines for about two months, um, but they do use um, alcohol daily, about two to three uh, drinks a day. They last drink the morning of the presentation. And I will, I will pause there to get any thoughts before I jump to the physical exam. Okay, so we opened Pandora's box, right? So um, that is exactly what I had referred to earlier, right? Like your your time course of of infectious versus non-infectious in a person with advanced AIDS is is now sort of obviated. And the other thing that we have now invoked by 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 kind of defining her absence of immune competence with AIDS is really the fact that she could have way more than one thing going on. So in folks who have advanced HIV disease and with AIDS, the differential diagnosis should include many things. And even if you think you're narrowing onto one, these like people with this disease can humble you. And, and after the fact, as diagnostics mature, can really present with multiple things going on. So at this point in time, I think when we have when we see a CD4 of, of 24, and we have no reason to believe that that she would have consistently resumed therapy. To the point where she would have reconstituted. Is that correct, Maddie? Sorry, so, exactly. Um, yeah. So, so now we have a person that is uh, that that has advanced HIV with prior OIs presenting with with acute on chronic um, diarrhea with a high concern for an infectious um, etiology. The one thing I, I um, that I'm a little bit intrigued by is is actually the pain, so rectal pain or dyskinesia. Sometimes people will report to Nesmus, which is sort of the urgency or, or feeling of needing to defecate, often actually overlays proctitis. So the small volumes of stool that, that you're describing to me, uh, 
not leaders and leaders and leaders of tool plus the plus this sort of dyskesia that she's uh, um, reporting with rectal pain would suggest perhaps a proctocolitis in terms of localizing where the disease is. And we didn't hear exactly um, in her health related behaviors sort of a, a more detailed um, sexual history, but um, things that come to mind here are, are um, infections that cause proctocolitis in immunocompromised people. Um, one of those is chlamydia or chlamydophila, um, whether uh, with or without the lymphogranuloma venereum serotype. The other is HSV, CMV, as well as syphilitic uh, proctitis. So all of those um, can be sexually transmitted or reactivated in the setting of advanced um, HIV. I think we do have to think about um, Malignancy here as well with HIV, you know, sort of uh, um, um, a an intestinal lymphoma. The capacity that she's had, you know, usually capacity in the gut manifests with GI bleeds, but in theory, you know, I, I guess stranger things have happened. Like I said, I, I um, um, once you have AIDS, really the 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 possibilities are are, are pretty open. There's other. Um, um, uh, diarrheal uh, infections that associated with advanced AIDS like MAC and cryptosporidium, um, but uh, I typically don't really think of them as causing a ton of dyskesia and the rectal pain and, and these other things. But um, obviously, again, there's going to be a broad different a broad differential diagnosis. I think the exam will be illustrative in in some. I, I would focus on on performing, you know, if she is amenable to it and not in too much pain, a rectal exam to see if there's actually any frank blood or any mucus, uh, palpating for, for inguinal adenopathy, evaluating sort of for other signs of STIs uh, that may or may not be present at this time. Um, and obviously, we the, it starts with the vitals and to see how really, how toxic she is, how volume contracted she is, um, whether or not she's been, um, she's having a fever. Uh, and so I look forward to, to hearing um, what's present in the next aliqua. So uh, before moving on to the next aliqua, maybe you can touch a little bit about on your categories when referring to uh, chronic diarrhea. You already mentioned like cosmotic, secretory, and inflammatory causes. We have many students here. Uh, so maybe you, you can talk a little bit about how do you approach those? Like in this history, what makes you move forward to a, a category and away from the other? Certainly. So I, again, I start with tempo and, and night symptoms are two of my most important questions. Um, but in general, um, osmotic diarrhea won't, usually won't be present at night. So people will not be waking up to go to the bathroom. Uh, osmotic diarrhea can be acute or chronic, depending on how long the, um, the exposure to the agent causing the osmotic diarrhea is. Um, secretory diarrheas are probably some of the rarest um, they often make their way into these sorts of discussions because they're like sexy diagnoses, like you know VIP omas and Zollinger Ellison and all, and you know carcinoid syndrome. But but they are probably the rarest, and they are really categorized by liters upon liters of stool per day that are not that are present throughout the night. And that's not exactly what I'm hearing here. And lastly, there's inflammatory diarrheas, and what often are present with inflammatory diarrheas, which can be infectious or autoimmune or ischemic. Um, are usually, um, there's often pain, there's often blood, mucus, constitutional symptoms are variably present, and then sort of other sort of systemic symptoms can, can also variably be present. Those are the, the, the big buckets of diarrhea. And honestly, some, they're, they're really, it's a, a model is a lie that helps you see the truth, right? So like a lot of these can blend over and, and they're not kind of hard boundaries. Um, for example, you know, a lot of infectious diarrhea isn't necessarily inflammatory. So like there's, there's sort of, um, it, you can cross over uh, and it doesn't necessarily hold to the buckets or the silos perfectly, but but those are the ways I kind of keep it in my head. Oh, sounds really wonderful, thank you. Maddie, please go next. Yeah, I'm learning so much from your discussion, Dr. Estrepo. Thank you for walking through it so clearly. Um, so to answer some of your questions about the, the sexual history, so um, the patient reports that they're um, sexually active with one male partner, um, her husband. Uh, she does receive um, anal intercourse. Um, she's had several partners in the past, but for the past several years, it's just been this one male partner. Um, so jumping to the physical exam, so the vitals, um, the patient's afebrile, um, 37 degrees Celsius, Heart rate 119, blood pressure 108 over 76, uh, and satting 100% on room air. So in general, the, the patient appeared thin, 
um, but in, in no acute distress. Uh, for H, E, and T, um, moist mucous membranes, um, no thrush that was noted in the mouth, uh, no lymphadenopathy noted. Uh, for cardiovascular exam, regular rate and rhythm, um, normal S1, S2, no murmurs. Uh, pulmonary exam uh, was clear to auscultation bilaterally. Um, abdominal exam. So the patient was uh, diffusely tender to palpation in all four quadrants um, with hypoactive bowel sounds noted. noted. Uh, and the rest of the exam was unremarkable. So I can give you some initial uh, basic labs before, kind of before can passing just, to, yeah, um, go ahead. Travel, as she had, I mean, you mentioned she's unhoused, she's sort of um, variably sheltered. Uh, has she yeah. had any, any like travel or any uh, animal exposure, any, uh, any sick contacts, you know, the usual like yeah. ID <laughs> um, yeah. targeted history? Great question. So um, no recent travels, as I said, so in terms of housing has lived on this periodically on the street and then periodically in the single room occupancy um, units for the past year. Um, no travel outside of San Francisco recently, um, no noted sick contacts and no um, farm or animal exposure. And, and is she US you know, born? Yes, US born. And um, no, like kind of asked if there's kind of any um, foods that the patient has been eating that have been you know, particularly unpasteurized or felt that they were spoiled, um, they can't kind of identify anything top of mind. Okay. And you said chills at home, right? They, yeah, they have so um, been experiencing chills. The only thing is that everyone has chills. And I, I aim to save everybody on this Zoom hours of your medical career so just just upfront, whenever you're going to ask about chills, just describe them, because my experience is that like 95% of people have chills, and what you're really trying to get, yeah, yeah, I have chills, right? Like everyone says that, but like what you're really trying to get at is a rigor, because a rigor suggests that there's a pathogen in blood, and so usually I'm very dramatic, and I say teeth chattering, bed shaking, get under five blankets kind of chills. Um, and I, the vast majority of the people go, oh, no, 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 nothing like that. But the ones that do, you should listen because no good ever came from rigors. Is she rigoring or is she having chills? Um, I believe, so I, I think for the purpose of this, uh, just case you can say that there are, have been rigors. <laughs> okay. Again, things <laughs> that like make, that make infections and some severe invasive infections more likely are, are right. Yeah, I would say that, I would say that. So again, I'm, before we even get into the labs, um, her immune competence state, um, some of the localizing history to the, to the, with the, with the rectal pain, so it makes me worried about uh, an infectious process, plus minus uh, dissemination, um, with a variety of, of, of pathogens possible, bacterial, sexually transmitted, and otherwise, and um, especially with her currently experiencing houselessness, I mean, who knows what her, her food supply actually is actually um, compromised of. I'm worried about viral um, inoculation as well as reactivation. Um, parasitic seems a little less likely based on the travel epi, um, and, um, I think fungal also seems, this seems pretty dramatic, but, but we'll see, I guess, when, when we get a little bit more data. Um, so syphilis, CMV, HSV, um, LGV and non-LGV chlamydia all, I think, need to come into our minds in terms of, of, of infectious pathogens with the usual kind of EHEC and ETEC and all the bacterial pathogens that, that commonly cause colitis. All right, great. So I will jump into the um, initial labs that we had. As well and, as, as Mac, that, that somebody just commented. Yes, we had mentioned Mac earlier, but um, important to put Mac and Cryptosporidium on, on the list as well. Great. Um, so before I jump into the lab, so for full disclosure, so I know this patient from the outpatient setting, but the details of this case are from reviewing their records from this recent um, ED admission. All right, so um, jumping to the lab. So for the CBC, 
Uh, the white blood cell count was 5.1, hemoglobin 12, platelets 276,000. Uh, for chemistry, the sodium 143, potassium 3.6, chloride 107, bicarb 26, BUN 11, creatinine 0.57, glucose 109, calcium 8.5, magnesium 1.8. And we have an AST of 39, ALT 25, Alkfos 81, T-Billy 0.2, and albumin 3.7. Um, a lipase was sent, which was within normal limits, um, as well as a TSH, which was within normal limits. Um, I can tell you the um, ECG showed sinus tachycardia. And um, if you have any if you want to make any comments, I can pause there or I can share there was um, a CT abdomen and pelvis with IV contrast was done, which I can also share. Maybe maybe okay. we can pause there for one second. Sure. And the, the thing that is amazing about these labs is how normal they are. Um, so what should we expect in a person that is that is voicing profuse diarrhea on their lab? We should expect signs of volume contraction, right? We maybe like their their creatinine being elevated. We should certainly expect hypokalemia. We should and we should expect a non-gap acidosis. And she has none of those. Her BUN is even normal, which will usually rise before creatinine um, goes up. So this here tells me that she's probably having small volumes of loose stool, which again would make a small bowel process a lot less likely. It's not impossible. But, but her bicarbonate is totally normal, right? She has not been losing that much free base in her stool. So the, the thing that strikes me about these labs are, are really how totally normal they are. Like, so that means that either more than one thing is going on at a time, or it means that sort of whatever this process is, is not making her lose crazy amounts of, of volume and electrolytes in her stool. Um, and that's, I think, the biggest thing. So, so if I were to guess what the CT is going to show, it's probably less likely to show a lot of small bowel wall thickening and probably more focused localized uh, colonic wall thickening, maybe some stranding. Um, but I'd be also curious to 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 see if there's a lot of adenopathy that's present um, in the gut or any masses or, or 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 whatever else may pop up on the CT scan. Um, but just really shocked by how normal her labs are and. And, you know, the albumin is mired with pitfalls, but like, that's a solid albumin. Like that's, that's like 0.3 away from mine probably. So like, she's obviously at least able to eat enough to, to maintain these, these, um, these numbers. Uh, Dr. Restrepo, if you're seeing this patient like for the first time, like you're receiving a consult um, and you see all this lab results, this uh, physical exam, besides the CT, uh, what, what, what else would you order for this patient? So certainly, I think, um, did we have a, a rectal exam? Is there blood, have we seen blood in the stool or has anybody visualized blood in the stool? I, from reviewing the records, I did not see any notes about a rectal exam. Um, the, per the patient, there was no blood in the stool. I didn't see any notes about a rectal exam though. Okay, so I think in this really immunocompromised person, the differential diagnosis is like enormous, right? So um, Obviously, we want to consider diagnoses that are present in immunocompetent people as well as immunocompromised people. I would say that most people being admitted with this story um, would end up getting C. difficile testing, stool cultures, blood cultures, the CT as sort of uh, an, an ova and parasite. I think most people would end up getting those tests. I think she should 1000% get those tests. In addition to that, I would say, you know, we need to get fungal, um, we need to have mycobacterial isolators in the blood, and I want, I really, you know, um, um, I, I recognize that Maddie's telling us that she's been monogamous with her partner, but I, I do believe that that there should be testing for um, STIs in this case. So I would um, test her for um, syphilis by by um, either direct treponemal or indirect treponemal testing, depending on what your institution does. For example, mine does the the trep sure, which is the the, the direct treponemal testing. I would send, um, I mean, obviously in anybody I would send an HIV, but we already know sort of what's been going on. We don't really have a reason to believe that too much has changed in terms of her, in terms of her 
um, viral burden and her, her CD4 count in this short amount of time. Uh, I would test her for chlamydia, swab, and gonorrhea, but I would also, I, I forgot to actually mention gonorrhea is one that we need to put on the differential here. So gonorrhea and chlamydia, they both cause proctitis. So I forgot to mention it earlier. I would put it back up on very high up on the list. Um, for testing for gonorrhea, you want to test the sites where there's actual sexual intercourse. So urine for everybody is going to miss people that have gonococcal proctitis or gonococcal pharyngitis. Same thing goes for chlamydia. So it'd be a nucleic amplification test from a rectal swab, as well as from, from the urine in this case, um, both for chlamydia and for gonorrhea. The HSV and CMV are usually more pathologic. So we, uh, we, we would, you know, in somebody like her, you'd send a CMV PCR. An HSV PCR would be less useful here. And then to really get at the, the, the uh, to get a good sense of the diagnosis, I think ultimately there's, um, if, no, if some of these non-invasive tests all come back negative, um, we need to talk about sort of sigmoidoscopy and actually getting histopathologic confirmation of what's going on. Um, other things that I think in her that we would send for is actually testing for cryptosporidium parvum, um, which is separate often from the ONP. So, and then in general, MAC is really hard to grow from stool, but in theory, you would, you, you, it's usually more frequently caught by mycobacterial isolators on blood cultures. And I think that's, if I'm looking at my differential diagnosis, um, the CT, and then depending what this non-invasive stuff and the CT shows, then I think then um, uh, opting for sigmoidoscopy would be probably the next step. Does that, that was a really long-winded answer, Rafa. I hope I answered. No, no, no you answered perfectly. No, no, you answered perfectly. Uh, another question that came to my mind is, um, I never know in this case if I start or not um, broad spectrum antibiotics. Would you start in this patient at this point? Okay, that's a super great question. There's not actually a great um, answer for this. I think um, let's just say we're suspecting or we have a CAT scan at this point and we, we have colitis, for example, and the story is compatible with colitis. Um, the indications to start antibiotics, which are not based on very rigorous data, would be things like hypotension, like concern for sepsis, and then usually like large volumes of diarrhea or, or really an immunocompromised host. So you could consider after getting your diagnostics, treating uh, her, which I think with the description of rigors, I'd be concerned enough after getting a lot of blood cultures to, to start treating her for enteric pathogens in this case. Um, Salmonella, E. coli, Campylobacter, the, the usual more common and potentially in somebody that has a CD4 count of 24, lethal infection. So it's not wrong uh, because of her immune competent state. If this was an uh, immunocompromised state, if this was an immune competent person, you'd say those labs look pretty reassuring to me. I'm not worried about sepsis, the vitals are good. Um, we can watch and wait. So I think it depends a lot on how frail the host is. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Uh, perhaps she's back to have bacteremia, but she, her immune system is not strong enough like to mount uh, a response like a high fever. Uh, so Shema also asks, uh, how can you explain hypokalemia in the setting of diarrhea? Um, the colon secretes a lot of potassium. So if you are basically having a lot of flow through the colon, you're going to lose potassium uh, luminally in that in that cell. That's the most common um, mechanism for it, but there may be fancier things that that my brain doesn't recall. Yeah, someone someone else mentioned. I think it's Shema as well, like uh, uh, activation of your eye system. <laughs> uh, I think because of adulterone, right, leads to the hypokalemia. Uh, so, Maddie, please go next. All right, I'm really loving this discussion. Um, so the CT abdomen and pelvis actually showed no acute um, abnormality nor evidence of pancreatitis. So really it was overall negative. Uh, for some of the microbiology uh, data, so C. diff PCR was negative, uh, fecal leukocytes negative, uh, there was a stool um, ONP that did not grow any pathogenic organisms. Um, of note, it did grow um, two names that were a little bit hard to pronounce, um, but were both considered non-pathogenic. It was like endolimax, nana, and blastocystis hominis. Yeah. Oh, blastocystis, yeah. That's people yeah. wonder if we should treat that or not, yeah. 
Yeah. So this, when, when we get to when we get to treatment, I can tell you what the team thought of that. But um, it grew those two organisms, and they were thought to be um, they were considered non pathogenic. Uh, there was a microsporidia stain, which was negative. Um, um, AFB culture for MAC showed no growth to date. Um, STI testing was done, which um, was negative as well. And so um, I'll pause there because kind of the next piece of information I have will reveal the diagnosis. That's the um, the blood cultures and the stool stool cultures, um, which ultimately revealed um, the diagnosis and then what the patient was treated for. So that's really interesting. Um again, valuable in, the, in its negativity. Um, I think at that point in time, we, you know, the one thing is that, that people without an intact inflammatory response will actually not have a lot of inflammation on imaging. And so this is a super valuable lesson here in that you can't, it's sort of like, I think I quote Robbie when I say this, you, in order to have fat stranding, you have to have fat neutrophils, right? So like very thin people or neutropenic people aren't going to actually have fat stranding. So the same thing happens with HIV, right? You can have crazy amounts of disease, but but not a lot on our imaging because our imaging is really actually waiting for, is using the signs of inflammation like, like bowel wall thickening and fat stranding to actually get to, um, to, to actually um, uh, manifest on, on uh, radiologically. So, you know, just because it's normal doesn't mean that there's not something bad going on. Um, like I said, it sounds like there's some non-invasive diagnostics that, that are still pending. But if, let's just say you hadn't had an answer, this would be a case to, to go in and look with, a, with, a, with an endoscope. Um, you know, what does this take off the table? I mean, I think a lot of the STI testing and a lot of the localizing um, things, to, to, of things that cause practicalitis are maybe less likely. So, so this really leaves sort of traditional bacterial enteric infections, salmonella, campylobacter. Salmonella, I think, is, is a, um, um, was she ever actually febrile while she was with you or while she was in the hospital? Uh, it did not look like that she became febrile. She was afebrile okay. the whole time. Yeah. All right. So no, no, no opportunity for fever tachycardia dissociation or anything like that. Um, but so we're looking for, I mean, E. coli, Campylobacter, Salmonella, the usual causes of of um, of, of enteric infections, um, and obviously MAC is still a possibility, as like I had mentioned, are tough to grow in stool cultures, but can often be isolated um, with mycobacterial isolators. Um, but just because all of the stuff is normal does not mean that 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 we have actually like ruled out a diagnosis. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I'm, um, uh, to, to consider, you know, we didn't see a lot of adenopathy or again, bowel, uh, bowel wall thickening to suggest sort of intestinal lymphoma, um, EBV or non-EBV associated. Did she have the CMV PCR at all or? Um, let's see, CMV PCR, I'm actually not entirely sure. I can go back, but, um, I guess for the purposes, it's. Negative. It was negative. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and then um, the STI testing. I'm just curious. Um, was it from a rectal swab or and and like syphilis testing and everything? Exactly. So syphilis testing was negative. Um, I believe it was from a rectal swab. Okay. Um, so again, we have a very immunocompromised person presenting with acute on chronic diarrhea and rigors. Um, to suggest uh, an infectious etiology to, to diarrhea um, with a very, very normal workup thus far. So this is a, a challenging case um, uh, for, for, I think for those reasons, just because the differential diagnosis is so, so, so broad. Um, and, and, you know, this is the problem with, with these exercises is that there's often a discrete answer, but like what I want you guys, whether or not I, I we've mentioned the disease that actually is in question here, um, I want you guys to remember that like these folks often have more than one thing going on. And so like, once you find the first thing, please don't turn your brain off and please don't, you know, like, please keep looking for stuff. Cause I, I just had a case like this recently and the, his mycobacterial blood cultures came back positive, like weeks after I discharged him. So things keep on popping up, um, in, in these folks. So um, yeah, my suspicion is either sort of a traditional enteric infection in a person with AIDS, 
versus uh, Mac based on the stuff that we have thus far. Yeah, I think that was such an important learning point that you just highlighted at the end. And um, so I can move on to the last alquad and you, uh, so basically stool culture showed, um, grew Shigella flexneri um, oh. and blood cultures. So one out of two bottles up on the blood cultures grew Shigella flexneri as well. So the, the final diagnosis here was Shigella, sorry, diarrhea due to Shigella enteritis complicated by Shigella bacteremia. Um, so I, I can read a little bit about kind of how the team approached um, treatment here, but I wanted to pause in case you had any kind of immediate reactions you want to share about that um, before I go into yeah. how treatment was. Yeah. That is fascinating. Um, and it's a, so, so people with Shigella are sick as stink. It is a virulent organism, meaning that it causes a lot of disease with a tiny inoculum. And people often have crazy amounts of blood and it causes inflammatory diarrhea. So, so this is again, going back, I'm smiling because like this is a great example of you not having an intact immune axis and you not actually manifesting canonical manif like presentations of a disease. So um, I think the important thing is that people with Shigella have like bad belly pain dyskesia like she had, but they're usually having bloody, bloody diarrhea. It cause, it's a cause of dysentery. Um, and so just to remember that in order to have all that inflammation, you need to have a coordinated immune response. Um, so again, I mean, a typical enteric infection, um, as we had mentioned, presenting with, with sort of insidious subacute symptoms, which are usually very discordant with this pathogen. And actually, I'm kicking myself because it was the one of the only one of the enteric pathogens that I didn't list. And I was like, I know there's another one that I haven't mentioned yet. <laughs> no, you mentioned enteric pathogens. And I think that's just such an important point. Like, um, really, just the fact, like, using the immune status of the host and having, because someone's so immunocompromised, that can really affect kind of how they manifest um, the presentation of, of something like this. So, um, Basically, so as when I was kind of reading the notes by the ID doctors, they were talking about exactly as you said, like the differential diagnosis in an immunocompromised host, other things they were thinking about were viral infections like CMV, HIV, the parasitic infections, though the stool O and P were negative. Um, but they kind of said here that they favored treating the patient first um, before moving to a kind of a colonoscopy with biopsy to evaluate for CMV or HIV colitis. Um, so in terms of treatment, so they, let's see, the, um, on the stool cultures, the Shigella was resistant to ceftriaxone, fluoroquinolones, and sus susceptible to unison. Blood culture is also resistant to the same and susceptible to unison. So the treatment was um, IV unison and then transitioned to uh, PO augmentin with a total uh, treatment course planned for 14 days given the um, bacteremia. And it seems like the patient did report improvements in stool with that treatment. Um, for kind of going back to the initial uh, cultures growing the few kind of non-pathogenic um, organisms, uh, you know, usually they're, they are considered non-pathogenic, but given the patient, patient's immunocompromised state, they actually, ID recommended um, 10 days of metronidazole, which is what the patient was put on. Um, and then the patient was restarted on antiretrovirals for her HIV with some TUSA and also um, prophylaxis um, for opportunistic, opportunistic infections, PJP with, with Bactrim and fluconazole. Um, so that is the case, but I'm just really kind of blown away by your discussion, Dr. Estrepo, and how you um, really approach this case so brilliantly. Yeah, it's, um, it's a humbling case, right? And like just so much of what we, so much of how we respond to illnesses is, is contingent upon an intact immune system and, and you can kind of really rewrite the script however you want when you don't have that in terms of the of a diagnosis. So this was the really, really good case to illustrate that. I think that those are my big reflections. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Resirpo. Um, so maybe looking back, like if you could give us like two teaching points or learners what would you say for them? Um, that you're 
you're only as good as your inputs, right? And so, you know, you have to know the limitations of your test based on your patient. And there's like, if you, if, I don't know, we have Epic at my institution, but it's like red and black numbers. I think like everything in this, in this person, except for her CD4 count is like black, right? And that doesn't mean that something in her vitals are black. And that doesn't mean that anything is, um, that doesn't mean that nothing is, is not wrong with her, right? She was bacteremic. So keep that in mind, right? Like it's all about the, your patient, their epi and the story to that really like should color the lens of how you approach every single test that you're looking at. So that's the biggest thing I think about that I would take away from this is like the entirety of our workup of our fancy tests are negative or normal, right? And it's still not reassuring. And she can still have cra like crazy bad things going on with all of this being normal. Uh, phenomenal case and phenomenal teaching points. Thank you so much, Maddie and Dr. Ristripo. And thank you, Shima, for, uh, for the amazing scribing. Um, so maybe we can um, move on and finish with the teaching points with the amazing Maria. I got the times messed up, so it's going to be yes. <laughs> oh, no problem. Go, go ahead, yes. Okay. Sorry, I didn't change the name. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Restrepo. Amazing case, really humbling, as you described. Um, I think as many as, uh, of us, we were we didn't uh, thought about this in our differential, but every day you learn something new, right? So in our approach of diarrhea today, we were talking about the importance of no noting the onset and the duration, if it's acute or chronic, if it's less of what, four weeks, more than four weeks, it's also very important to note if the patient is immunocompromised. In this case, uh, since it, the patient was immunocompromised, we had to consider a viral re reactivation and all, or other um, infections such as MAC or cryptosporidium. Uh, also, night symptoms, this patient with nocturnal awakening uh, will suggest a uh, spastic diarrhea less likely. And all these characteristics can help us differentiate between a spastic, inflammatory, uh, infectious or non-infectious etiology. And being the, the, the secretory diarrhea, the rarest category of diarrhea, where the, vol the volume is commonly higher. So those kinds of, uh, this kinds of symptomatology will, will be seen in uh, diseases such as carcinomatoid syndrome. Carcinoid syndrome. Again, always interrogate uh, our patient about personal history, travel, animal contact, occupational exposure, stick contacts, etc. And the dyskinesia and proctitis could also suggest proctocolitis and disinfections that can cause it are chlamydia, HSV, syphilis, and CMV. Uh, again, H HIV AIDS, can predispose our patients to cryptosporidium infection and MAC. Uh, when interrogating, again, we have to ask our patients about chills or rigors, where this is a most, more intense uh, shivering. And so we can try to characterize what kind of uh, theology are we dealing with. Uh, for testing, consider fungal etiology, mycobacterium, CDF, syphilis, direct or indirect japonemol, chlamydia, gonorrhea test being a urine and rectal swab where it is uh, suggested due to the personal history of our patient and as well as HSV and CMV PCR, cryptosporium parvium, OMP stool test and as well you can also consider sigmoidoscopy and at the end we find out this was she held infection which normally causes blood or yeah, and an intense symptomatology but as I just found in an article uh, this, we can also think about Shihela in, in people who have um, uh, bad access and inadequate access to sanitation and clean water, as well as people who engage in oral and anal sexual intercourse. And those are all the teaching points for today. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. What a phenomenal session. And I just want to echo what Shima said. We can't wait to have another session with Dr. Restrepo. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Have a very good night and a happy, happy holidays. Happy um, holidays. Happy New Year. Thank you again for having me.